Ladies, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is being recorded. So, if you, have, if you know anybody that is not here tonight, um, let them know they can go online and just listen to our Bible study. Okay. So, that was a great meeting. Thank you, ladies, for those who participated in that. I really appreciate it. And really, all the ladies in the chat. Um, before we actually get started with tonight's lesson, I want to recap a little bit on the last lesson. The last time we studied how to be sure you're a Christian. Anybody tell me how are you sure that you're a Christian? Okay. Anybody else? How do you know that you're a Christian? I hear myself. Well, I'm supposed to pin it out here somewhere. Y'all can't hear me? Okay. That sound better? Yes. All right. Anybody else want to say, how do, how do you know you're a Christian? What did we learn last week? Remember two, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? It's for by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of our works, but it is the gift of God. And then we have to believe in him who died on the cross for our sins, you know, the shedding of his blood, and we trust him for his promises when we said he's going to do. If I said, you open the door of your heart, I'm going to come in. We have to believe that. We have to believe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So basically, it's having faith in Jesus in his word, in what he said he's going to do, and what he's already done. Okay? All right, so let's go to the, well, before we actually get into the um, lesson, I just want to open up in a word of prayer, okay? What is it? Uh, Father, we just thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity to come and just learn about you and learn your word. You know, we're all growing Christians, and I just pray, God, that you will continue to teach us how to have a close relationship with you. Lord, I thank you for each lady in here tonight. Lord, you have a lovely time to be in your life. I pray that you will just give me a lovely change of thinking. I pray, God, that you will open my heart to hear the word and the truth that you have for us to hear tonight. And just give us wisdom, Lord, and learn how to apply the principles of the truth that you in our lives so that we can have that personal relationship with you on a continuous basis, Lord. So, Father, I just commit this time to you and I pray that your words would just flow through me. Um, Lord, just give me what I need to say to impart to these ladies here tonight. Father, for may you increase and may we decrease, God. For we will say worthy to you. We give all the honor and glory and praise to everything that we do. In the precious name of pray. Amen. Okay, so this concept was how to experience God's love and forgiveness. And, um, and the first concept we really learn who Jesus was and that the scripture in the Bible tells us he is God. And because he is God and all the miracles he performed, we need to be able to trust that. Um, Jesus is trustworthy. He's worthy of our trust in, uh, in him. Um, but he didn't live on earth just to prove that he was God. He 
came to give us eternal life to offer us forgiveness, set us free from sin and guilt, and to give us a full and beautiful life here on earth. And it is because Jesus is God who can provide forgiveness from sin, enable us to live life abundantly. Because, you know, we might be thinking, who in the world is going to go out and forgive my sin for everything that I've done in the past? And, you know, when we were in our old sinful nature, you know, there's a lot of things we, we did that I'm sure we regret now that we didn't mention, but... You know, sometimes the sin can be so bad you just feel like, you know, I can't forgive myself. How can God forgive me? Well, God can forgive you, and you need to want to forgive yourself as well. But there were a lot of Christians today that really never heard of how they can live their life. Um, some of them, you know, feel like having a close relationship with God is just foreign to them. They just they don't they don't know anything about that. But the first century church Christians brought their world. They were filled with the Spirit and compelled by the love of God. The early church took the good news of God's love and forgiveness to the entire world and made a huge impact. Twelve men that God chose, they walked with Jesus, you know, on a daily basis. They, they felt his love, his presence, his teaching. Twelve men turned the world upside down. And I think today, I always ask myself, if twelve men back then could do the same, why can't we twelve men do the same today? It's never been done since then. And I don't have the right answer for that. But those Christians were ordinary people just like us. You know. But one of the keys is that they were filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us don't understand that concept, but that's why. We're getting this um, to tonight. So you want to ask yourself how you can have influence in the world that you live in and how you can start living a life. But so first we're going to talk about the three types of people in the world. First person is a natural person. Now I hope y'all can see the my board over here. <laughs> um, does anybody want to give a kind of explain? What does a natural person mean? They do not believe in Jesus. That's what you were before you became a Christian. You know, um, the things of God is foreign to them. They're spiritually dead to anything that has to do with God. Um, and I just want to know that this circle here of the natural person, the circle, represents um, your life and the chair there represents the throne of your life. Okay. Who's sitting on the throne of life? Who's controlling your life? Okay. Natural person is Satan or self. They're out there doing their own thing, which is what we all did before we accepted Christ. Um, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But something wonderful happens in the spiritual and in the natural person of the man. Somehow he came to know God. Somebody shared the gospel with him. You know, whatever, but he surrendered his life to God, and now he is a spiritual man. All right? Anybody want to explain what a spiritual man is? A spiritual man is somebody that is saved, that believes and receives, and uh, God is on the throne of his life. He's walking in the will of God, and um, Absolutely. Um, you see the chair here where Christ is on the throne? Self is yielding to Christ. Okay? Um, now, those little dots in there represent your interests. You know, and, and not that your life is just a thing like that, but it can be in more harmony. Okay? But you see, when God's in your life 
And then Satan is trying to get in, but right now God's on the throne and Satan cannot get in. Okay. So whenever we invited Christ into our lives, we wanted him to come in and sit on the throne. In other words, we want him to be in control of our lives. Okay? Um, the spiritual man is filled and controlled with the Holy Spirit. The act of staying filled with the Holy Spirit is the act of deliberately keeping Christ on the throne of your life. God does not demand control of our lives. We have to willfully give it to him. But when we decide that we're going to yield to the flesh and take him off the throne, we will step down. Okay? Um, we will not do it happy, <laughs> but we will do it. Again, because we're, we have chosen to be in control of our lives. Um, whenever we decide to take control, and this is over, I would say, state of mind, um, lifestyle, kind of, and we deliberately refuse to confess sin in our lives to God, then we become what we call a worldly believer. Okay? Anybody want to share what you think a worldly believer is? Okay, that would be kind of like those are the spiritual man. Um, when you whenever we invite Christ into our lives, our old sinful nature is really not gone from us. We always are going to have that sinful nature because we are not perfect. Um, but we are still yielding by the throne of our lives to God. Okay. What? The worldly believer does live like they are lost. You know, um, if you look at it here, like the circle where self is on the throne now, Christ is still in the life because just because you have dethroned God from being in control of life doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. You're still a Christian, but you become what we call a carnal Christian. Because now you're still directing yourself in the sin. Okay. It, does, it does take much to do that. I can get angry at Helen and, and stay that way. And I, I have become a worldly Christian, a worldly believer, if I don't go to Helen and apologize and take care of that problem. I put God on the throne and I'm in control. Right. But I have to put him out of my life. A lifestyle, basically. A lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That would be more like a carnal Christian when it comes to a lifestyle. That's when you're continually not listening to God, you're not yielding to God, and you know that sitting in your life that God has revealed to you, but you refuse to confess that to Him. And I would have been confusing if what I was saying to go to you or even to God because I felt like I was lying. Right. And sometimes you can't tell the worldly Christian from the natural person of them because if you never knew they were saved, you wouldn't get them. I mean, the interest, everything they do is about the same. Basically. Um, I would call it back to your thing. Yeah. The worldly thing is sugar coated. Yeah. 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 I've been away from God, I've been close to God, okay, so I, but I 
But I think at some point in our life, we've all been the world of Christian at some point. We've, we've all been there. Okay. Um, the world of Christian is one who is in Christ and is also involved in sinful nature. He would claim for all who do sin. God still has possession of this country. And Christ is here in this life of infants and has fallen into sin in one or more areas of his life. Not yielded to God, the world we believe it is in a period of stunted growth. Okay, when we become carnal, when we're not confessing sin to God, we're not growing in the God's will. Okay? Um, spiritual growth because he's not confessing and repenting of uh, his sin, and Satan has succeeded in influence and controlling him through his way. Now, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 3 1 through 3. He's talking to the Christians of the, the church at Corinth there. Dear brother, I have been talking to you as though you were still just babies in the Christian life who are not following the Lord, but your own desire. I cannot talk to you as I would to healthy Christians who are filled with the Spirit. I have had to feel, feed you with milk and not with solid food because you could digest anything you swallow. And even now, you still have to be fed on milk. For you are still only baby Christians controlled by your own desires, not God. In fact, you are acting like Christians who don't belong to the will of God. So these are, are Christians that just were not woven in the law of the Lord. They became carnal. And Paul is saying, you should be mother in your walk with the Lord. Because you know Christ still God you. Why aren't you doing this? Why are you born? Why are you just still babies, you know, um, in, in Christ? So the cause of Christian on one is has on one hand his own self-interest and tries to have God's blessings on the other hand, but he fails all the time because again he's trying to live the Christian life through his own efforts and it doesn't work that way. Is that considered the soulless realm versus the spiritual realm? Where there's that um, warfare going on all the time within us. Yes, yeah, so we're going to get into that. There's, there's always going to be warfare going on in our lives. Spiritual warfare. Because of our sinful nature and our spiritual nature, basically. We're going to go into that here. Um, the stage of carnality or unconfessed sin is a miserable existence. <coughs> Sad to say, and it's where a lot of Christians are, is at the state of finality. Um, let me read Romans 7, 14 through 20 in our book. Paul wrote, the law is good, then, and the trouble is not there, but with me, because I am sold into slavery with sin as my owner. I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what is right, but I can't. I do what I don't want to, what I hate. I know perfectly well that what I am doing is wrong. And my conscience proves that I agree with these laws. I am breaking. But I can't help myself because I'm no longer doing it. It is sin inside me that is stronger than I am that makes me do these evil things. I know I am rotten through and through. So far as my old sinful nature is concerned, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. By not doing what I don't want, it explains where the trouble is. Sin still has its evil back on me. Um, I'm sure we've all felt we were in that situation at some point in our lives. And Paul is, is sharing this with us, I believe, to let us know he would experience this and that he became a Christian. I mean, look at what Paul did before he became a Christian. He persecuted the church. 
um, that we struggled with it and we're going to struggle with it, but there is victory in it. Does anybody feel like that even now? You know, you still want to do what you should be doing, but you can't do it for whatever reason? All the time. Yeah. That's the spiritual warfare within us. Every day we're going to experience that. Every day of our lives. Paul also wrote in Romans 7, 21, 24, he says, it seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I live to do God's will as far as my nature is concerned. But there is something else deep within me in my lower nature. That is at war with my mind and brings the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant, but instead I find myself enslaved to sin. So you see how it is. My new life tells me to do right, but the old nature that is still inside me loves to sin. Oh, what a terrible predicament I'm in. Who will free me from my slavery to the deadly lower nature? Well, Jesus Christ did. And Paul found that he was the answer to that. You know. So, you know, the thing is, as you walk with the Lord, know that you're going to sin on a daily basis because you're not perfect. And we need to know how to overcome that sin and still maintain a relationship with God. And that's what we're going to get into here. I sometimes have to read that book back in um, chapter 7. Where it says, um, where he's talking about he couldn't help himself. That he said, but I can't help myself because I'm no longer who he is. I have read this a hundred times <coughs> I've read in my lifetime or more and never noticed those little words that I am no longer doing. It's sin in my life. It, it is sin. And I, I think that Paul had a real personal personal glimpse of how hot he really was. You know, um, and maybe if he really took the time to look within us, we could see how really rotten we are, you know, and stuff. But it's the Holy Spirit that supplies power for us to live as a spiritual person. We cannot live the Christian life through our own efforts. We must trust Christ to live the resurrection life through us. He alone can enable us to live as he should. The Christian life is a supernatural life, and only Christ, through the power of the Spirit, can enable us to live it. The Holy Spirit liberates us from the vicious power of sin. Only the power of the Holy Spirit will give us victory. It is by faith you can experience God's love and forgiveness and live as a spiritual person. Faith, not your effort, pleases God. Just remember that. It is faith. It was all about faith in concept number one. How do you feel your Christian? It's by faith. Taking God in his word, trusting his promises. And now it's by faith that we can experience God's love and forgiveness. Only our Lord has the power to believe to deliver us from the worldly life to a relationship of great joy and fruitful blessing. The better you get to know God, the more you will trust Him. And the more you trust Him, the more you will experience His love and limitless power in your life. So again, how do we, how do we receive God's blessing? Simply confess your sin and accept His forgiveness by faith and it's simply a process that we're going to start in the spiritual just as you exhale and inhale physically, you will exhale and inhale spiritually. You exhale spiritually when you confess your sin. Exhale, confess your sin. The Bible promises that if you confess your sin to him, he is faithful, just to forgive us and to purify us from all the unrighteousness. That is in 1 John 1. But to confess our sin is a threefold agreement. Okay, we're agreeing with God whenever we confess our sin, it's a threefold. Over here, the 
and that's in our sins. Number one is that we agree that our sins are wrong in the view of God. God is holy and will have nothing to do with sin. Even though he loves you so much, even if you have unconfessed sin in your life, God loves you tremendously, but we still need to pay sin as seriously as he does, and he has nothing to do with sin. Without acknowledging our sin, we have no hope of salvation. 1 John 1, 8 and 10 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim we have not sin, we make him to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So second, we must recognize that God has already forgiven our sins through Christ's death and the shedding of his blood on the cross. Confession is an expression of faith and an act of obedience which results in God making real in our experience what he has already done for us through the death of his son. This real and ongoing experience of God's forgiveness helps us to remain an open channel through which God's love and power can flow. Unconfessed sin short circuits our relationship with God. We have unconfessed sin in our lives. God cannot work in our lives because we have broken the relationship and not confessed that sin to Him. So to maintain a victorious Christian life and live a, as a spiritual Christian, we must confess any sin that enters our life the moment God's Holy Spirit reveals it to us. If you refuse to confess your sin, you become carnal and walk in the shadow instead of the light of God's love and forgiveness. I'll share this with you ladies that um, about a week ago, my husband did something that was just kind of made me mad. <laughs> and, um, and we always have some um, clothes hanging up at a uh, certain place in our house here. And I just went and dropped my clothes. I left this right there. <laughs> you know, and, you know, it, it wasn't then that God convicted me that that was wrong. It was a day later that God convicted me that, you know, that, that was not out of love. So I confessed it, got back in fellowship with God, and so did it. Simple little things like that. that we all encounter every day in sin. Bible says that which is not from faith is sin. But God may not reveal your sin the moment right here that you commit it. It may be a day, it could be an hour later, it could be a week later. But when the Holy Spirit does reveal that to you, that's whenever you need to confess it and get back in fellowship. And then third, we repent. We repent. So repentance is a change of attitude which results in a change of action. Through the strength of the Holy Spirit, we turn from our sins and change our conduct. Instead of giving in to the compulsion to what our worldly, fleshly nature wants to do, now we do what God wants us to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's all about appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit. Through confessing our sins, we begin the process of spiritual breathing by exhaling. We change from a worldly Christian to a spiritual Christian by inhaling the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit by faith. So a lot of people today deny the stain of their sin. They may say, you know, that was just a little tiny dot line. That's not bad. You know? Or you may have some people say, well, they do it worse than I do. But you know, sin is a sin. There's, there's no level in God's eyes about, you know, what we do as to is what about more worse than another sin. Sin is sin. I 
Well, that guy there was a sin. <laughs> it, you know, it is a sin. But the only hope that we have to overcome sin is the supernatural cleansing. The cleansing that only God can perform through His Son, the Lord Jesus, who died and shed His blood for our sins. I think we're all very familiar with King David in the Bible. He committed adultery, had Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed in battle. And yet, he's described as a man after God's own heart. You think, how did all the men be after God, all the evil he did? All right? Um, Psalm 51, 1 through 3 says, O loving and kind God, give me David, saying, Have mercy on me and take away the awful stain of my transgression. O wash me, cleanse me from this guilt. Let me be pure again, for I admit my shame to you. David, King David, was repentant of his sins. He knew what he did was wrong, and he repented to God, and he asked forgiveness for it. And he experienced a joy in it in Psalm 32, 1 through 5. He says, What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven! What joy when sins are covered over! What relief for those who have confessed their sin and God has cleared their record! There was a time when I didn't admit what a sinner I was, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day and all night, your hand was heavy on me. My sleep evaporated like water, and on a sunny day, until I finally admitted all my sins and stopped crying and hiding, I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. God knew that he sinned. God knows all of our sins. And we have to be honest with him to confess all of it to him. When we experience difficulties, I encourage all of us to look to the Lord and ask, Lord, is there any sin in my life that I have not confessed? That is required you to discipline me? The scripture says that those who God loves, he disciplines. When we experience difficulties, it's important to look into the mirror of God's word and confess any sins to the Jews. God's cleansing from our sins that hinder us opens the way to the abundant, fulfilling life of the Jesus of Calvary's truth. So by faith, we can simply claim as true what Jesus Christ has said and done for us. By faith, we can view ourselves as God views us, as his child, love, forgiven, and clean. By faith, we can confess our sins and repent. And by faith, we can confess God's forgiveness and clean. So you see, you see that word again, it's all by faith. So, you may be asking, and you may have heard somebody ask this question, well, if Christ has already forgiven me of my sins, why do I have to confess? Why do you think we have to confess it? He's already forgiven me. Yeah, he definitely wants to hear from us. You know? We have to acknowledge. You know, I've always heard the phrase, you cannot change what you don't acknowledge. If we don't acknowledge the spirit of our lives, then we're not going to change. But it's the Holy Spirit that reveals that to us. By confessing our sins, we act on our faith in God and his word. Confession does not give us more forgiveness. Christ has already forgiven us once and for all. But by admitting our sins, we establish in our experience what God has done for us through the death of his son. First, in, in John 17, 22 and 23, Jesus prayed, I have given them the glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. I am them, and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me, even as you have loved me. That just tells us that God loves us as much as he loved his only son. And that is so hard to kind of to grasp all that. <clears throat> When we confess our sins, God in his unconditional love welcomes us back and eagerly forgives us. 
Instead of running away from him with fear, we can run to his loving arms with confidence that he does forgive us. We can be created honest with God. By ignoring our sin, we become dead. And we're living in the shadows instead of the light of God's life when that happens. First John 1 6, 7 says, if we say we are his friends, but go on living in spiritual darkness and sin, we are lying. But if we are living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ does, then we have wonderful fellowship and joy with each other, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. So perhaps maybe you are aware of some sins that you haven't confessed to God. As I've said, that sin does disrupt our communication, our relationship with God. When we tolerate, sorry about that, when we tolerate sin in our lives, we cannot hear God. We become discouraged and confused. Soon we find ourselves operating on memories of God instead of living in violent interactions with Him. So all we need to do to experience God's forgiveness is to confess our sins. <coughs> And exhale spiritually. To put him on the throne of our lives, we need to inhale uh, the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit, and that is by giving him control of our lives. I don't know why Dr. Bill Bright came up with this principle of spiritual food, but I think that because, you know, I'm taking breath every day. I'm exhaling and inhaling physically every day just to stay alive. That's the way it's going to happen in our spiritual walk with God. Because we are sinful. You know, I, I could be confessing, I don't know, 100 sins a day. You know, when Scott and Lynn think about that which is not from faith or sin, that's a lot. But as long as the Holy Spirit reveals that to me, I have to confess it to him. And it can be so many times a day. It's not once a day, it's not once an hour. It could be after we spend half an hour. It's just, it's just that frequent. And I as a person think that maybe that's why he came up with that analogy of it, is that it's a constant thing. We are constantly breathing physically, and we have to be constantly breathing spiritually. Any questions about that before I go any further? I love that example because if we don't breathe, we don't have life. We don't, absolutely. If we don't breathe spiritually, we don't have a relationship with God. That's right. You know? So you may be thinking, how do I really incorporate this? You know, I have learned through the years that whenever I start praying, I always ask God to reveal any unconfessed sin in my life before I even start asking for anything. Because I want to make sure that the channel is open to God, you know, that He is going to hear and answer my prayer. So I always start out hard if there's any sin in my life now that I have not confessed, please reveal that to me. And I've been trying to pray for a while. For the Holy Spirit to, to show me. And then wherever He shows me, then I confess it. And then I start my prayer. And I always put Christ on the throne of the Lord. I know I took the throne back. I acknowledge that I sin. I thank you that you have forgiven me of that sin. And I want to put you back on the throne of my life. And I want to be the power of the Holy Spirit in my prayer. And that is just trusting God in the promise of and through the power of the Holy Spirit. To stand him through it, we have to trust him and believe it and act on it. That's the main thing we have to act on. Now I know some of you have questions. You have to have questions. And we're not done yet. Some of you have to have questions thus far. Anybody? Thank you. 
Well, I mean, whenever I realized it was wrong, I got convicted me, I confessed it, and, you know, I kind of probably knew that I just got this part, but I was just, that, that little moment was rebellious. <laughs> that little moment. And I was
studied what I did. And I kept calling um, and I said, I said, Net what? And she said, Win the face. Win the face. <laughs> she had to tell me, she tells me over and over again, stay in the face. I said, I don't want to go deeper. <laughs> but um, it, it is so much fun. I enjoy it. I love getting in the Bible and being so enthralled. Because the Bible has something for everybody, believe it or not. It has something to it's got boring stuff. I mean, for any teenager that wants to read about boring stuff, it's the Bible full of it. You know, and I'm just saying that. I'm just wondering, what does that make me want? You know, there's a great map drawn on my when I had a revelation day. It, I, it, it has been so hard for me to understand that God is Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son. Oh, Jesus well, has the Holy love. Spirit. I finally got it. I was going to touch your mouth over here. Mm-hmm. I finally got it. He's all of it. Yeah. He's all yeah. of it. And I never knew that. So, you know, and that he gave his only begotten son to forgive us. How could he be giving his son if his son is dead? And he said, I'm God is.
Alright, so you get that done. Now what we do is tear the tear it up. You destroy the lid. Alright? What does that mean? God has forgiven us of our sins and he remembers it no more. They're gone forever. Okay? Um, Psalm 103, 12 says that our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. They are buried in the deepest sea, that's Micah 7, 19. God has put them behind his back and remembers them against us no more. That's Jer Jeremiah 31, 34, Hebrews 8, 12, 10, and 17. So, if you continue to have feelings of guilt, not from God, it could be from Satan. Maybe you weren't completely honest with God when you did your list, all right? Or it could be that you just need to claim victory that Satan may be putting this doubt in your mind that you've not forgiven of that sin yet, but you can claim victory and say, I know God's forgiven me, and claim the victory in it, okay? So that's just something you're going to have to answer in your own life. So again, the main thing that I want us to learn from this concept today is how do we um, appropriate spiritual freedom in our own life every day. We're always going to be in battle within our spiritual warfare. We're always going to be committing sin. Just because we got saved, God didn't take away that old sinful nature. Okay, we still have that, you know, each and every day of our lives. We have victory in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to live defeated lives anymore. Once we commit sin, we confess that to God, and we just keep putting Him back on the throne of our lives. You know, we are that spiritual Christian in here um, that we want to all be. But whenever we refuse to put Him on the throne of our lives over a period of time, deliberately not put Him on the throne and confess it, we become a worldly believer. Okay. And we're living a defeated life. God has so much more for us to live. We won't have done it like this. And that's the way to do it. It's spiritual freedom. And do that spiritual way. That spiritual way. Now, I know it's 8 o'clock. So I'm glad we got through the lesson. But if there's anybody that has any questions, if you want answered in the back of the book, um, I think we went over a lot of these. I'll be happy to stay here a little bit later. And go over to if everybody has to leave. All right. 
Then if I have any questions in the back, then you really want to go out and go. What what is humans do? What is humans do prior to building What which uh, what number is that? Oh, number nine, what influence do pride and humility have in the Christian life? Right, pride keeps us separated from God because pride is sin. Humility brings us back to God. We have a humble heart. Um, I put with pride comes shamefulness, with, with humility comes wisdom. And that's the same thing. That's right. Yeah, and it's really whatever the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. But if if I'm sinning against when, I don't think the Holy Spirit needs to know about it. You know, when's the only one needs to forgive me as well as God, and I just go to when and He makes things right. You know, but um, there there was an illustration where there was a pastor of a church. And he was having problems with some lay leaders in the church. And he developed resentment and hatred towards the leaders. Okay, y'all remember the reading about that? And um, so whenever he was repentant, he went to the lay leader because it was more than one person. I don't know if he went individually or if he just went to all of them group. You know, and said, I'm sorry for the way I've been treating you. I've hated you. You know, all that kind of stuff. And made things right. So it's just whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. to that exercise we just did, um, how can we destroy the list to make restitution? You may need to go to somebody and make things right with them. You may need to go and ask for forgiveness for how you've been thinking badly about them or something or another. You know, that's all part of making things right with God. You can confess it to him, but you might need to go confess it to somebody else. As well, it depends on again what you're talking about, Sharon. What the sin is, basically, make that restitution whenever it's needed. The Bible says if you had a son, um, a um, offering to take to the altar, don't take it if you have upset somebody. You need to go take care of whatever that problem is and handle it before you do anything. And I tell you, I see so much pride with people today that keeps them from really having that relationship with God. Because we have pride in our lives if we sin. You know, we can't be walking with God when we have pride. We cannot. But when we have that humility and we're humble, that's getting back to the right relationship with God.
she did something to me, what if that person did something outside of the church, not to anybody here? When did the person go before the whole church? Maybe it was, it was something that affects the whole church. Maybe was it something that caused a division within the whole church? Well, I would tell that the sweet tree I love to a long part of the Matthew 18, verse 60 says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the uh, mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses, even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose in earth will be loose in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. But what if nobody here is with it? This person is this church. The main thing is, ladies, be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Yes. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do, be obedient to that. Okay? 
Um, our next song set was on called "I Had to Go to Sarah." Thank you, ladies, for coming. I'm so glad to see all of you here.